I'm going to start with a little bit of site news um, from Coweta. Um, our LTR funding is going to run out this fall. So this summer is going to be our last summer of data collection as an LTER. We've got two remaining um, graduate students who will be finishing this year and uh, we'll be turning off our active website next month and launching a static legacy website. I want to point out that the U.S. Forest Service Coweta Hydrologic Laboratory is going to continue to operate normally. They have a new director. His name's Chris Oishi. He's a um, flux tower specialist. Many of our last cohort of investigators plans to continue place-based research at Coweta, and we will continue to work on synthesizing our past findings um, after we wrap up. So as part of this synthesis process that we've been going through the last few years, one of the things we've, we've come to realize about the, the Southern Appalachian ecosystem is that it's big changes that really are all stories of human actions. Um, so this is a, a Google Earth image of the upper Little Tennessee River Basin. You can see a highway corridor running from north, from south to north. That's US Highway 441. There's another highway corridor running east to west at the top of the figure. That's Highway 64. And you can see um, in the lower left, and now all that dark green is where the Coweta Hydrologic Lab is. And a lot of our site-based research is based there in the forest. But at any meaningful scale, when you get to a third or fourth order, fourth order watershed, you find that you've got rural development, small farms and rural residences in the valleys. And you get to the bigger valleys, you get bigger farms, and you got commercial development. And at any sort of meaningful scale, you've got a lot of direct human um, actions and land uses imposing themselves on the system. In 1994, NSF um, provided Coweta an augmentation grant to expand our research to include fundamental socio-ecological questions relevant to the larger region. Um, interestingly though, since that uh, expansion of um, our research foci, the relationship between LTR and social ecological science has been up and down. And what I want to impress upon um, you through a short story is how important humans have been to this system. If we look at the last 220 years, pretty much every major ecological change has been driven by direct human action and land uses. So first of all, the European settlers came in and forcibly removed the, the native Cherokee and moved into Oklahoma, um, began widespread clear cutting of forests from ridge to ridge, um, expanded the area of row crop agriculture. As a result, we got a large increase in valley sedimentation. You know, we basically have a meter of sedimentation on our valleys. We introduced rainbow and brown trout. Um, we introduced the chestnut blight, which completely changed our forests. Um, later on in the last 20 years, we introduced the hemlock woolly adelgid, which further changed our forests. Um, we've had in the last 40 years a large increase in, in exurbanization with people moving to the region as retirees or for second homes. And then on top of this, we've had climate change. And we came to realize that a lot of things that we were researching and studying at the smaller scales in our, our first order and second order watersheds um, really had small, were, were affecting small ecological changes relative to these large scale changes being um, enacted by direct human action. Another one is fire suppression since 1950. So, you know, when we look at our system and our trajectory and the idea of trying to um, predict future states, we can think about our current state as being um, a function of current climate, current land use, but also as the legacy effects of past land use, previous climate, and past disturbance. And as we go forward, that's going to continue to be the case. And new drivers will include population growth, development, importation of plants, soils, pests, changes in fire suppression, and U.S. Forest Service management small farm economics, um, non-traditional and sometimes illegal forest product markets, uh, particularly riparian landowner behavior, even the management of county roads, which are responsible for a huge amount of the sediment load in our streams. 
So when we think about the future of our forests, um, a lot of these questions end up being questions of, um, of human actions. So, you know, things that we're still worrying or wondering about is what's driving forest mesification? Could fire reintroduction reverse that forest mesification? And what are the timescales of this ecosystem memory? So if we change things now, how long does it take to, to have an effect and how long will the, will the ecosystem remember it? Will our clear and cold water streams stay clear and cold in the face of continued exurbanization? Or conversely, could we mitigate some climate change effects through riparian restoration? Um, one of the social questions we have is do southeastern mountain residents accept development policies that will protect stream ecosystems? Um, there are a lot of, there are a lot of uh, forest scientists trying to engineer chestnut blight resistant chestnuts. Will those be reintroduced to the system? And finally, one thing for the LTR network to consider is why does socio-ecological research still face skepticism, given how important it is at larger ecosystem scales? And that's it. Thanks.